wasn't doing my job. I forgot to start the video. Forgot to fix this thing up here. I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm not doing very good, am I? Uh, <clears throat> got a card uh, there from uh, Joe and Jenny Ellison. It says, I want to thank you all for everything. Uh, the prayers, cards, food, and flowers. We sure appreciate all of them. Thank you so much, and God bless you all. And uh, the card says, sometimes God answers our prayers through special people. Uh, thank you all so much. And so we appreciate that. Appreciate folks thinking about them over the holidays and these kind of things. Jenny had a birthday here, uh, so uh, it's a blessing. We're thankful for uh, those uh, folks. Well, at the bottom there of our bulletin, don't forget about our basketball ministry. Uh, that's uh, uh, really kind of gearing up now, getting ready to move forward into the month of February, and uh, we've got a good group of boys and girls involved. We've got a lot of new families that we've never had the opportunity to minister to before, and uh, so we're excited about that, and uh, we're thankful for uh, how God's using that to give us the opportunity to, uh, to take God's Word and to share it with children and also to get it into the homes of parents. And then on the game days, we share the gospel uh, in a, in a, uh, at a halftime uh, in a short devotion or a challenge from God's Word uh, every single game throughout the day. And so uh, over the course of a day, there's hundreds of people that come through and they get to hear that. And so we're thankful about that. I was calling, uh, taking care of some scheduling and doing some things for our calendar for this coming year. And I... Uh, called uh, up at one of the local nursing homes and rehabilitation centers and spoke to one of the folks there and uh, told them who I was and she, she said, oh, okay, you're the church that has the King's Court basketball program, aren't you? And I said, yeah, that's who we are. And she said, well, I wanted you to know we appreciate you, your church, doing that in our community, giving boys and girls something like that to do. Uh, so that was a blessing and uh, she was very helpful to us. and. Uh, we're thankful for uh, how it does impact and touch some hearts and lives. On the back, don't forget Sunday. Of course, that's a great day, special day. We're looking forward to it. And uh, then uh, don't forget, uh, just like your bills are rising, so does the churches during the wintertime. And just uh, help us by praying and doing all that you can do to help out for the next few months. And I know the Lord will provide for it. Uh, we are thankful. We had a good positive year last year and uh, off uh, we believe to another good year this year so uh, we're thankful for God's faithfulness and God's goodness to us here at our church but it's good to have everybody here tonight and maybe somebody this evening has a, 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 an answered prayer a praise a testimony a verse of scripture something at all like that that you'd like to share uh, we always encourage folks to do that on a Wednesday night so uh, you just feel free to do that. If you want to take your Bibles while you're contemplating that, turn them to Psalm 13, 13th Psalm. We'll read that in a minute, but if the Lord lays something on your heart, uh, feel free to share that. Let's look at this psalm, just six verses. Uh, the book of Psalms in the heart of our Bibles. Uh, you take out all the extra helps out of your Bible to where you just have Genesis to Revelation and hold it up and find the middle and you'll probably hit right into the book of Psalms. It's right in the heart of our Bible. <clears throat> uh, it deals with the heart. It reveals God's heart and it also deals with our hearts 
Uh, by the way, neither of the two change. God's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His heart is unchanging. The hearts of men are desperately wicked. They always have been and always will be. Uh, but the book of Psalms deals with the issues of the heart. And uh, when we look at Psalm 13, let's look at these six verses. I'll begin to read. You follow along with us. Verse number 1 of Psalm 13 begins with a question. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou, wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Six verses of scripture, but there is a wide spectrum of things going on in the heart of the penman of Psalm 13. When we look at it tonight, there will be times in your life when things happen Things come into your life, and you don't know whether God sent it or the devil sent it. You don't, you're not going to know. There's going to be times that happens. And if the devil sent it, you can be sure God allowed it. If the devil sent it, God allowed it. We see that in the precedent of the Scripture Let's look at these things and just quickly, just three things about this psalm. The first thing, just to jump right into it, we see is the plea, the plea of the psalmist. It's, it begins with one question after another. Uh, we don't know, uh, you know, specifically what incident this is, this is enveloped this individual. We don't know what that is. I, I believe, most Bible scholars believe, this was probably penned by David. And we don't know what incident in David's life was transpiring, that, that this, this was recorded for us to, to see how God dealt with David and the heart of David in this matter. But four times in two verses, he's crying out, How long? How much longer? We know, what he's, we know what he's talking about. He's asking God, how much longer? And, you know, uh, there are so many difficult and trying periods of David's life, it would be hard to try to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, you know, speculate about what was going on. We know that for a period of at least eight years, maybe nine years, David lived fleeing from Saul day and night. Day and night, not knowing whether in the middle of the night Saul and his armies would find him. Saul was bent on killing David. The jealousy of his heart, the, uh, the rejection of Saul as king by God, uh, all these things and many more uh, put a, a, a rage in the heart of Saul. David fled from him. He lived in caves, lived in the forests. He lived... Uh, out always watching over his shoulder, always, uh, uh, always, you know, worrying possibly about trusting this individual or that individual, whether they would sell him out or not, uh, knowing David uh, that he was never able to stop and stay in one place for any length of time, being separated from his family for eight years. David lived his life this way. You know, that, that, that alone, if we didn't look at any of the other things in David's life, will be enough to cause you to cry out, Lord, how long? How much longer? You know, we're, we're ready to go home after a week's vacation. 
<laughs> we can't stand it anymore. Think about not only just being away, the discomfort, but the fear of, of impending death. And this, this, this continual state of turmoil in his heart. Uh, we, we all are going to have times of trouble in our lives. Uh, we know this is, this is true. It was true in 2013. It was true in 2012. It'll be true somewhere down the road in 2014. There'll always be times of trouble that we go through in our life. And uh, sometimes those times of trouble seem to last forever. And then we look back over it and we see it, you know, it really wasn't that long a period of time. But boy, it sure felt like it when we were in the middle of it, didn't it? Trouble, times of trouble. Uh, you know, we, we think about uh, whatever age we are, we're going to have trouble. These teenagers over here tonight, if, if, they, if they would sit down and talk with us honestly, they would have such huge troubles, at least in their eyes. And those little boys and girls, there'd be so many of them tonight who have legitimate, troubled lives and homes that they're coping with. And it doesn't matter what age we are uh, because, you know, if you mark that one principal scripture in Job chapter 14 and verse 1, we realize that man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. And that includes every one of us. And it's not, it's not a respecter of person. Uh, it doesn't regard age. It doesn't regard finances or places of, uh, of social standing. It's, it's absolutely neutral. It comes to all men. Trouble. Trouble. You know, I know people, I know people in the twilight years of their life, people who are maybe in their 80s, 70s, 80s, they're, they're dealing with trouble that 50 years ago, they never thought they would ever have to deal with that when they got to that place in life. You would think by then it's time to sit in the chair and, you know, uh, feed the birds and the things I like to do. Wait a minute, I don't, I'm not that old yet. But, you know, uh, you, they, they would never imagine. Th these are the troubles uh, that should have been through and out of their life 40 years ago, and now they're still dealing with things. Trouble. Our lives are full of trouble. And, you know, victory in life is not times when trouble is absent, but it's rather keeping hold of the presence of the Lord even in times of trouble. That's victory. Trouble is going to come. But being able to have and hold and know and be aware of the presence of the Lord in the time of trouble, that's real victory. That's real victory over those troubles. You, you know the psalmist here, he's asking, How long wilt thou forget me? That's what he says. Now, that's how he felt. And we probably have felt that way. You know, sometimes we say things that really don't make any sense, but they make us feel better to say them, I guess. I find myself talking to myself sometimes, or maybe not necessarily to myself, but I'll say something out loud, like, oh, come on, after I do something silly, you know, I knock something off or whatever, and I stop and say, who am I saying that to? <laughs> you know, but it makes me feel better, you know, or whatever. Or you've got to be kidding me, you know. <laughs> you know, but, but David is saying this, he's asking this question, how long wilt thou forget me? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? Now David probably could go back and look at those statements later on and say, you know, I, I really didn't realize what I was saying. You can hold your place there, but let me turn or give you some scripture you can look at sometime in Isaiah, the 49th chapter. Isaiah chapter 49 and uh, verse number 15. Let me just read that verse, Isaiah 49 and verse 15. The Bible says, uh, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful. Oh, I'm in the wrong verse. Let's, let me get to it. Verse 15. 
Here's a question. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Now, God's asking you a question. A woman, a mother, in her right mind, with the love that God puts in a heart of a mother for a child, can she forget that child? Can she just lay it down and walk away? Not in her right mind. Not with the love intact in her heart that God places in there for that child. He goes on there uh, to say, Yea, uh, they may forget, he says. I'll even allow it that they might. But the rest of the verse says, But ye will I never forget. He's talking about his people Israel. He's talking about his people God's children. He says it's even possible for a mother to maybe lay down that child and walk away. You know, sometimes women feel like that's the best interest for that child in the circumstance or situations or whatever's going on in their life and make some of the hardest decisions they ever make in their life. But God said, I will never forget thee. And David, the psalmist, the writer, is asking the question, Lord, how long will thou forget me? How long will you turn your face from me? And we know and we realize that the answer to that question is God never does and God never will. It may seem that way. It might seem that way to us. If you read the 16th verse of Isaiah 49, it says, verse number 16, he says, Behold, and this is something you know, but you've forgotten it. Don't forget this. It'll help you. Behold, I have graven thee, on the palms of my hands. I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. God looks at his people. And, and, and you know, uh, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we're his and he is ours. We're in him and he is in us. And he will never forget us. Uh, his people are graven upon the very palms of his hands. You know, when we see the Lord Jesus, I believe we'll see the print of the nails in his hands, don't you? And every time he looks at that, I know he saw me because he took my, my sin to Calvary's cross. Every time the accuser of the brethren, the devil, comes and accuses me day and night, day and night, uh, before the throne. And you know, he doesn't really have to even lie about me. He, he can tell the truth for the most part, and he's right. But thank God, thank God that Christ can look and say, No, you see this devil? He's mine. And the blood of my precious blood has washed him and cleansed him of all sin. And now he's mine and will be mine forever, for eternity. He will never forget his own. Never forgets us. There are times of trouble we go through when it seems as if the Lord has forsaken us. There are times we go through when it seems like he's forgotten. But we are to seek him and look for him and long for him. Even in those times. Because he desires us to do that. He does not want us to forget him. That's the problem. It's not that he forgets us. But it's that we so often forget him. But the psalmist plea, the psalmist plea. Let's look at this second simple thought, the prayer then of the psalmist. When you come to the third verse, he begins to cry out, Consider and hear me, O Lord. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. You see the little word, lest. It's a word that we don't usually work into a sentence. There's a good Scrabble word for you Scrabble players. You use the word lest. What does it mean, Pastor? Well, it means, it means this. I feel like if you don't do something, I'm going to die. That's what it means. God, if you don't intervene, I'm not going to live through this. This is, what, this is what David's saying. He's saying my future depends on your presence, your help, your intervention, uh, your hand upon my life. Lord, if I don't know it, see it, recognize it, have it, I'm not going to live. I'm not going to make it. That's what he's crying out. He says, he says there, consider, hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. 
If you don't, if you don't show up in my life, Lord, I, I'm not going to live through this thing. And I know there's things we go through where we wonder, are we going to make it through this? Am I going to make it through this? David was going through one of those things. That trial's not unknown to so many of the Lord's people. Those kinds of trials. And if you hold your place there and write down this verse of Scripture, 1 Peter chapter 4, you remember that verse, 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange. You know the rest of that. Concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happeneth unto you. And, uh, you know, uh, we know that we go through trials. We know that we face these trials and these, these issues in our life. These trials, he says, of faith. Trials of faith. Fiery trials that we face. God, God will give us spiritual strength uh, in those fiery trials that we would never gain in any other way. We would have never gained them in any other way lest we go through that. And know the, the, the dependency of the Lord. Know the strength and, and, and the grace of the Lord. And He causes our dependence on Him in those trials to grow in a, in a way it would never have otherwise grown. We, we tend to not grow closer to the Lord when when the sun is shining and all things are going well, we tend to grow closer to the Lord when the trials come, when the difficult things come, when, when the darkness comes, there's some treasure in it. And one of those things is that it, is it teaches us a reliance on the Lord, a, a deepening of our faith, a, 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 an expanding of our, of our dependence upon the Lord, which is exactly what He wants. And uh, those things happen through those trials. And he says, don't think this is a strange thing, that this should happen to you. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're a child of God. Yes, you're going to eternally be with me. Yes, these things are true. But don't think it's strange that you too do have to go through these things. And don't forget, as we tried to preach on Sunday morning, God has places along the road of his will in your life that he wants to take you to. And take you through. And some of those places we see him reflected in the Lord's life. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. God brought him to that place. And there uh, as he lay upon the ground. No doubt that there was the thought. I don't know that I'm going to live through this. But God strengthened him. And he got up and went forth with a resolve to go to Golgotha. And give his life on Calvary's cross. There are places in our life where God wants us to. To go so that we can meet with him and he can reveal himself in a new and a great way and strengthen us and move us forward in the work and will and plan of God for our life. We, we have to go through those places. We meet with the Lord in those places. In 2 Corinthians, if you want to mark this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we come there and the second letter to the church at Corinth and the Bible says in verse 3, Beginning in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Sometimes we wonder, Lord, where are you? And God, don't you know? Don't you see? Don't you care? Oh, yes, he sees. Yes, he cares. But you know what? It's not just you and I he sees and cares about. It's a lot of other people he sees and cares about. And if we'll look to him and draw near to him, he'll strengthen us and comfort us. So somewhere down the road, he can use you to help comfort someone who's going through something that they don't know that they're going to be able to live through it. And they're going to look back on it and they're going to say, you know what? God sent that person into my life. God gave me that individual to help me get through that because they knew what I was going through. We ought to want that to be us, that God could use us. God could take our lives and use them to comfort someone else. 
David's plea, his plea of, Lord, why and how long and why aren't you seeing me? You know what it turned into? It turned into a prayer meeting. <laughs> Things will change if we'll get with God and let God have control of the prayer because it's not long before we start to see things in a different perspective. He puts a different view upon things, and things begin to change, and that's what happened to David. David's plea grew to a prayer meeting. His trial caused him to look to the Lord and draw nearer to the Lord than he had been. And God wants us to look to him to help. He's near. He's always near. Uh, he... He, he will never, uh, he will never uh, not uh, be there for us, but, but will give us what we need to get us through if we look to him. We read 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, but let me read for you the 13th verse. I'm glad the Lord, uh, he, he, he doesn't mind to uh, tell us the way it's, way it's going to be. But I'm thankful he often tells us why it needs to be that way. And he tells us about that. And, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, he says, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Every trial we go through every time and season of darkness in our life, these, these are opportunities we have to glorify Him by our faith in Him in that trial. We had a basketball game. I still volunteer at Grace and coach the high school girls basketball team. And about, well, I guess it was probably uh, right before Christmas, we had a ball game scheduled with them, and they canceled the game because one of the high school students in their high school died, a young man. He had, uh, he had severe uh, juvenile diabetes, and it led to some real complications, and that young man passed away, a student in high school. It just devastated their student body. They canceled the game for that week, and we understood that, and we eventually made that game back up. But uh, we played them again Monday night, and the lady that's the scorekeeper for them, my, my wife keeps the scorebook for me, and, and this other girl was doing it for the other team. And I asked at halftime, I, I said, how are the students? How are these girls? Are they, are they coping with this? Are they dealing with this? I said, kids are so resilient, you know, they, they can bounce right back and go. And she said, you know, they finally have turned the corner and uh, now they are undertaking projects and different things they can do to try to, uh, to raise the awareness of juvenile diet. They've taken up a lot of projects that they can do to try to, you know, and, and attach that f with his name. And they, they've got, I guess, some student T-shirts in his honor and some different things. They, they're moving in the right direction. And, uh, you know, we were just talking about that. And, and uh, Hannon is a public high school. Uh, and... Uh, this lady, you know, we're always looking for opportunities to witness or share Christ, and they come in and uh, to a Christian school. And uh, but uh, we we said, well, you know, the Lord can give comfort and grace and help. And how how are the parents of that young man? And she said, well, she said, I I know the father. I went to school with him. He said they're they they're believers. They know the Lord. And said, you wouldn't believe how God's given the grace to just get through this and, and glorify him. And you know what? That, that's an opportunity that God chooses special people to have. And, uh, and, and they're making the most out of it. And she said, you know what? If it wasn't for the Lord, it wouldn't be that way. She said, we had another uh, family a few years ago. The same thing happened to them, but without the Lord. He said, it tore that family apart. It, it devastated them. They had nothing there to fall back on. And, and so difficulties, trials in our life, there are opportunities to magnify the Lord and to glorify Him in ways where the light can shine brighter than it can be when the sun's shining in our life. And, uh, and, and sometimes God sees that. 
uh, our people see how we're relying upon the Lord. And it has a greater impact on them to see that in the life of a Christian because they cannot relate with that. They don't understand that. And it causes their heart to want to wonder how that can be. But the, the plea of the psalmist, the prayer of the psalmist, but let's quickly look at this last thing, the praise, the praise of the psalmist. When you go back to Psalm 13, the uh, fifth verse, he says, But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. What a, what a, what a broad spectrum of things we went through in six verses of Scripture, wasn't it? From the first verse, from those pleas and questions and the searching heart, not even thinking right about the things they're saying, till finally they get right back down to where it's all out. You know what, Lord? Even though this has all befallen me, you've dealt bountifully with me. It's in you I have salvation. I have salvation. And that's what it all boils down to. That's the bedrock of our faith. That's what will get us through and help us to get through. Even in trials, God deals mercifully and bountifully with us. He's not cruel. God is not unkind to us when he takes us through times of trouble. He's not being cruel. He's not being unkind. He suffered for us. He died in our place. We can't ever forget that. And it's our privilege to endure times of trouble for his sake as it's accounted to us as a child of God so that we can glorify him and we can magnify him. Here we, here we see that direct relationship of a man and his God. We see it here. We see it in verse 5. My, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. My heart and God's salvation connected that's, that's that relationship that all men have to have. Every individual's heart must have that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ for them to know salvation. They must have it. And uh, he writes about it here. And David remembers what he possesses as he finishes that thing out. I will rejoice in thy salvation. And you know what? There any trial that can take that away. No enemy can steal that away. And so in the end, David gets that thing turned around. And we see, uh, we see how he deals with, with that in his heart, in his life. This is something we all have to deal with. And may the Lord help us never forget that little psalm, just six verses of Scripture, that we can go to time and again and help, allow the Lord to help us uh, in our hearts. Well, we're going to finish up tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer together, and we always encourage anyone on a Wednesday night uh, who needs to talk about uh, the truth of, of the gospel and knowing Christ as your Savior to never leave a service but always stay after and, and let us take God's word and share that with you. But let's pray together, and we'll be finished here today. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us and your grace, and we thank you for the word of God that... Lord, is just what we need in our life, and we just ask God you'd help us to take these truths and, Lord, just by faith, uh, make them a part of our lives in a very real, practical way. And, Lord, we just ask now that you'd minister to everyone that's here. Uh, Lord, folks that are in the midst of trials and times of darkness, uh, even right now, decisions that need to be made, choices that are there, uh, Lord, we pray they'll seek you, they'll draw close to you, they'll uh, feel their hearts and minds with praise and uh, Lord uh, out of this uh, realization of how bountifully you've dealt with us how merciful you are at all times God that's what we'll base the decisions we need to make on and the direction we need for our life we'll see God that it's that we should stay close to you we should walk close to you and let you lead and guide us even through those valleys of life we pray now that you'd uh, minister over these next few days and help us, Lord, as we approach the weekend to, uh, Lord, come with expectant hearts. Uh, Lord, just resolute that God Sunday will be a tremendous day that we allow you to work in our life. And, uh, Lord, we'll just be steadfast and uh, being sure we're here and in our place and allowing you to do your work. So we'll thank you for it. Uh, keep us safe and meet needs. We pray again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.